Hello. During the uh, fall of my senior year in high school, I was simultaneously coming out of the closet to my best friends and only applying to one college and just kind of hoping for the best in both situations. Um, and I think it turned out okay. But when I think back on all the times of change that I've had in my life, they don't really even come close to what I consider to be the greatest leap of faith in my life, which was taking a full-time teaching position at an urban high school. So let's be honest, this white, suburban, tiny gay man that you see in front of you did not voluntarily apply to teach at an urban high school. The truth is that I was rejected by 12 suburban districts. Um, they all told me that I didn't have enough experience. And so, um, of course, I didn't have enough experience. I had just gotten out of college. I mean, how did you want me to get that experience? <laughs> That's a TED Talk for another day. But I was 23 years old, and I was having an existential crisis. So I went to a teaching agency to try and get a job quickly before the summer ended and the school year began. Because I went to college for five years not to become a substitute. I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to change lives. I wanted to teach kids. I wanted to get my Robin Williams on and my Michelle Pfeiffer on and teach like they did in the 90s movies. It was really the only thing I ever saw myself doing. Uh, even going back to kindergarten, you know, when I would come home from school and I'd line up my Beanie Babies and my, action, my Batman action figures and I would bestow my wisdom upon them and I would take attendance and grade fake papers and send Harley Quinn to the nurse's office to check on her multiple personalities. And it was all I ever saw myself doing. And so when the teaching agency came back and said, do you want to teach in an urban high school? I said, yeah, absolutely, sign me up. I got a job. But the truth is, I had no idea what urban meant. I bought a $100 t-shirt at Urban Outfitters once, and I thought that maybe <laughs> this was going to be one of those uh, real highfalutin schools, Dead Poets Society schools. But then they said that my interview was in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And then I got a, that's the city that we were told to avoid in college, and I got a better understanding of what urban meant. And, uh, you know, at that point in my life, I never really knew what the word urban meant. I was raised in the suburbs. I lived in the suburbs. I went to college in the suburbs. I did my student teaching in the suburbs. I never really separated the sub from the urban. And I look back at that ignorant time in my life with, with shame and, and a little bit of guilt. And so um, I got the job about eight days before the school year started. I was given my teaching schedule and the, a box of the previous teacher's materials. And that's when I got to re be really scared for the first time. I realized that A, I was woefully unprepared for the task at hand, and B, I had no idea what I was doing. In retrospect, no first-year teacher ever knows what they're doing. But if you do ask first-year teachers, there is a pit in your stomach when you realize that you are responsible for 100 plus students at the high school level. You have to teach them things you may or may not have even learned yourself. You have to give detailed lesson plans. You have to give detailed feedback. And you have to eat lunch in 20 minutes flat. <laughs> and then I looked at my teaching schedule, and it said that I had to teach African American literature. In case you were wondering, this tiny gay man before you had no idea about anything in African American literature. And so I had a choice to make. I could stay in my comfort zone and say, thanks, but no thanks, and wait for something in the suburbs to come up. Or I could take the job. And I think that's the funny thing about faith. We do what we do without really knowing why we're doing what we're doing, right? It's what my friend Brian, who directs the Connecticut Writing Project, calls the great whatever. It's this force you know, that pulls you by the chest, and suddenly you're not in Kansas anymore. You're in Bridgeport or you're in New Haven, or you're in New Orleans, and everything suddenly just comes alive. It is a force that you have to trust, even though you don't know what you're doing. And even though I didn't know what I was doing, I think I learned a couple of things along the way. And um, that's really what I'm here to talk to you about today. Um, so the first thing that I learned, or think I learned, is that when you have challenges in your life, you have to allow that to lead to some learning. Um, so they wanted this white suburban tiny gay man to teach African-American literature to a bunch of urban seniors. And someone clearly saw my love for the Broadway musical as a direct connection to the Harlem Renaissance. And they thought, this is our guy. He's going to teach this course. And all I kept thinking was, who, why on earth is anyone letting me teach this? And more importantly, how am I going to connect to these students? How will I ever relate to them? 
And so instead of letting fear get the best of me, I went home that day and I ordered the Norton Anthology of African American Literature. And like any good English major, I started to read. I started with African American Folklore, uh, Mules and Men by Zora Neale Hurston, uh, The Mulatto by Victor Sejour, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom by August Wilson, The Poetry of Melvin Dixon. And in the best sense possible, I got lost. The more I learned about the African American experience in this country, the more I reflected and learned about myself. Not as a white American, obviously, but as a gay American, and more importantly, as a human being. You see, the struggle for black identity in this country, as demonstrated by the groundbreaking essay, The New Negro, by Alan Locke, it made me think about my own lived experience. You see, I too, like Locke, was desperate to recreate my identity, not as a black man, but as a gay man. At that point in my life, I was told I was nothing by society, so I believed I was nothing. When I first started teaching, I couldn't even get married in this country. And this was an issue that transcended my race. And while I knew this in the back of my head, it was one of those clarifying moments for me where I realized that when you take race out of the equation, our connections to one another as human beings, it's, it's endless. And while I was clearly learning a lot about myself during this process, I was learning about the African-American identity, which I think was just really important to me because it was no something that was never even close to on my radar before. I never even thought about it because I was living in this pocket of protected suburban bliss. I was in a bubble, you know, where the wonder years and Full House told me what life was really like. <laughs> no, it's not like that. And the second I stepped into my classroom, I realized that there was another story being told in this country, one that I was blissfully unaware of. And that's when I really came to the conclusion that we, as human beings, we live in these personal and cultural bubbles that uh, we call safety nets or comfort zones, whatever you want to call it. And that leads me to the second thing that I think I realized in this whole process is that once you make some learning in your life, you have to allow that to lead to some self-improvement. And so while I realized quickly that there was another story being told in this country, the full weight of that realization didn't hit until a couple of months into that first year of teaching when a student of mine named Alex asked to speak to me in private. And Alex was a good kid. He was you know, an average student. He was friendly. Um, and he confided in me that he had gotten his girlfriend pregnant, and he didn't want to tell his family. And so after a lengthy conversation, we decided that he would, in fact, tell his family. And things were cool for a couple of days until Alex came to school with a black eye. And then he told me his dad gave it to him. And so as a mandated reporter, I had to call the Department of Children and Families. And the next day, Alex wouldn't talk to me. He felt like I, I had betrayed him. And um, that's the day that I felt my stupid, white, suburban bubble snap. I heard it reverberate down the hallway when Alex walked past me, and he didn't say hello to me. Alex said hello to me every morning. <sighs> Sorry. And then after a couple of days, thankfully, or a couple of months, really, Alex learned to forgive me. But my thinking towards self-improvement had already started. I started to think about this kid who had only known me for a couple of months. You know, he confided this immense secret in me. All I kept seeing myself as was just a stranger in a strange world in this building, a nothing to nobody. <coughs> but who was I to him? Clearly, I was more important to him than I ever thought I could be to myself. The second thing I realized is that, you know, this is happening right in front of me and I'm not watching it on television. I am participating in someone's legitimate pain and fear for the first time in my life. And I say legitimate because, you know, growing up in the suburbs, my biggest fear was that my house was gonna burn down and I'd lose my PlayStation. And that's not, it's not to belittle the problems of suburbia, which are vast. But it is to say that my colleagues and I who work in urban schools, we face what feels like humanitarian crises on a daily basis. And the last thing that I realized, which I think really helped with my self-improvement, is that we have a shared humanity which allows us to be part of a larger community. We become what Alanis Morissette calls citizens of the planet. You know, we're not citizens of a state or a town or a nation or a country. We are co-inhabitants on this earth. And we have a responsibility to each other to know our struggles, to know our stories, and to be able to see each other as human. And if that's going to happen, then we need to pop those bubbles that we are constantly trapped in. And that leads me to the last thing that I think I've learned through this, is that once you can lead to some self-improvement, then you have to allow those to guide your communities. 
So full disclosure, my first couple of months and or years, I was smoking about a pack of cigarettes a day when I was teaching at uh, Central High School. I have quit since then, it's a disgusting habit, but I do owe a little shred of gratitude to those cigarette breaks because they allowed me to build a little bit of a community and therefore build my identity. Any chance I could, I would be desperate to run out back and have a cigarette. Passing time, I was out back. Free period, I was out back. Lunch, cigarettes. <laughs> and sometimes I'd run into colleagues, sometimes you know, the janitor, sometimes a security guard. But every time, we would have conversations. Just real life, five, 10 minute conversations about life, not about work. And I, even though I was a new kid or a new guy there, they talked to me like I was there for 20 years. And it really made me feel like I was part of this community. I remember one time in particular, we had a brand new administrator. And um, it was casual Friday, so I was wearing jeans. And she had never seen me before, so she had come out to have a cigarette, and I was already out there. And she went off on me. What are you doing out here? Where's your pass? Why are you smoking a cigarette? Get to ISS. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm a teacher. I teach here. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a teacher. And then she gave me these looks, these eyes, you know, like the eyes my mom used to give me before she was going to yell at me. <laughs> and she just stops for a minute and she goes, well, well, you got a light? <laughs> and we've been friends ever since. And so I think when people take a leap of faith or they pop those personal and cultural bubbles they have, you know, it allows them to change their community dynamic. Sometimes those communities are subtle. Uh, sometimes they're a little bit more obvious. And sometimes they're warm and welcoming. And sometimes they're scary and unfamiliar. Um, I was very lucky enough that the community of Bridgeport Public Schools and Central High School was so warm and so welcoming, I found my identity quickly. And once I found my identity, I knew I needed to give back on some level. Uh, and so I created the Central Players, which is an after-school drama club where students could engage in the arts and express themselves creatively and ultimately give back to their own communities through art and performance. I wanted my students to learn these lessons that I'm talking to you about earlier than I did. And so nine years and 17 shows later, I've had hundreds of kids walk across that stage, popping their own personal and cultural bubbles in the process. And that leads me to here, to this stage at Yale University, where I had a former central player take a leap of faith himself. And uh, his name is Arnold. He is a first year here. He applied to his dream school. He got in, he found his way to the TEDx organizing committee, and he suggested that I be a speaker because he thought I had a story to tell, all because I was his teacher. And so if I didn't take that leap of faith 10 years ago, if I didn't per pop my own personal and cultural bubbles, I clearly would not be here today. I would never have met Arnold. I would not have a story to tell. And so I have to turn this on you now. Where will you be in 10 years if you pop your own personal or cultural bubble, or you take that leap of faith that you need to take right now. And maybe you don't need to take it right now, and maybe you are very open-minded, but that's the thing about comfort zones. They become comfortable over time. We don't notice it necessarily. So will you face it, and will you pop it in the future when it does surround you? And if you don't want to do it for yourself, I want you to think about the people that you might affect if you do, in fact, burst those bubbles. Because comfort zones are bubbles, and they are meant for popping. And if we truly want a better world for ourselves and our loved ones, we need to pop those bubbles and put this all into praxis. We need to learn from our challenges and ultimately become the best versions of ourselves. Thank you. Woo!